Hello, and welcome to this edition of Create a Life You Love. Now, as you know, I believe everybody has a dharma, a path that they're destined to be on accidentally or purposefully. Some people know this from early on. Others kind of get guided into it willingly and sometimes unwillingly. We're going to talk about that today with one of my favorite people in the world, Attorney Scott Wagner. Hi, Scott. Hey, Tony. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I, I can tell that the accidental dharma is what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, thank you so much for being a guest. It's such an honor to have you on. I'm really grateful you could be here today. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity. So, Scott, you have quite the story. You're an attorney. <laughs> I am. The first question I ask everybody, <laughs> when did you know you wanted to be an attorney? <laughs> I, I'm still trying to figure that out, but it was, it was not something uh, I was drawn to. It was something I sort of fell backwards into uh, because I had no other marketable skills, is the story <laughs> I like to tell. I uh, was fortunate to have an older brother who was a prosecutor for years and decided that uh, I should be an attorney as well. I originally wanted to be a musician, but I wasn't any good. Uh, I don't believe that. It was true. I was terrible. But it was a great way to meet girls, which at the time was, you know, what was important. Uh, and my brother uh, fortunately told me that I wasn't any good at it. Uh, and I, I listened to him, and somehow I ended up in law school. Um, <laughs> okay. That's a great, great way to end up there, though. I mean... Well, it, it beats working is what I was at the time. I was, it, it's, my brother is Jeff Wagner, as you know, who is actually on the radio now and I w for WTMJ and has been for years. And I was actually a broadcasting major because that's what I wanted to do. And uh, at the time, he was a federal prosecutor, as I said. And he came to me in my junior year and said, don't be an idiot. There's no money in radio. You've got to go to law school. So I went to law school, and now I work 12 or 13 hours a day, and uh, Jeff is now on the radio for three hours a day. So Awesome. He's the smartest Wagner, which is nothing anybody likes to brag about. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So where did you end up going to law school? Well, I went to Marquette. I really never had any interest in going outside of Milwaukee, uh, unlike my daughter, who is now in beautiful San Diego, and I'm very I'm jealous going to school. I know. She's, she's right. again, I'm not the smartest Wagner, but, uh, uh, and I, I had gone to Marquette for undergrad and liked it and liked Milwaukee, and so uh, that was really the only place I applied, and it worked out just fine. But Marquette is one of the best law schools. Well, it's funny because when I went to Marquette, because I'm really old, uh, the law school was this tiny little building on the corner of Wisconsin and 11th that was a fire hazard. No one from Marquette is watching, right? <laughs> but a after I was done with all the tuition dollars I had spent, they had built a beautiful new law school. Uh, it's like state of the art. It's all glass windows. Everything wi is Wi-Fi. I went back to uh, speak to a class about plaintiff's class action work, which is one of the things I do. And as I walk in, there's like signs where students can get massages and stuff. And, and it was a completely different law school experience than I had. Uh, anybody at my law school who offered you a massage, you wanted to stay away from. I, I think this new thing was, was something different. So do you think about taking a class just once in a while so that you can get get a massage and be in the new state-of-the-art building? Well, I would never say it that way. <laughs> oh, yes, maybe that's the wrong way. Right, I may, maybe I'll teach a class. And then oh, that's even better. You should do that. Right, because I'm you a little old to that. be a student at this point. but Never too old to be a student. It's close. Never. So you mentioned earlier you played music. What kind of music? Well... What type of band? Tell me, I need to ask. I know it's really not about the band, but I need to ask about the band. Well, uh, when I was 15, um, I, had, I, was a, I was a fat kid, and I've since become a fat middle-aged guy. I've reverted back. <laughs> but so. um, my, my sophomore year, between my freshman and sophomore year of high school, I shot up uh, six inches and lost 40 pounds. So I was suddenly, yeah. um, suddenly okay. And as we were in the high school, they had what they called the night scale. I went to Nicolet, and there was a kid sitting on a table playing a guitar, and all these girls were around him. I mean, all kinds of girls. And he wasn't any good. So I'm thinking to myself, you know what, I can do that. Uh, so I learned about six chords, and even smarter than that, I found a guy who was really good at it, uh, and the two of us would play uh, different bars, because at that time the drinking age was 18, and I was tall enough that nobody cared, and I wasn't drinking anyway. So we played around the city, uh, different things, and uh, had a great time. 
and um, was going to, was considering expanding our touring uh, uh, area, but my brother promptly told me that I sucked and I should really go back to doing something else, and he was ultimately right. It's, the funny part of this is most of the places we've played have either burned down or gone out of business. That is hilarious. Yeah, so I'm not so oh sure what the goodness. lesson of that is, but I don't think it's a career oh I'll go back to. Yeah, I, I get that. I get that. Yeah. So let's go back to law now. What sure. type of law do you practice? I'm a, I'm a litigator, which means I'm in court uh, as much as anybody is these days. And mm -hmm. I do commercial litigation, which means you know not family or criminal, but generally kind of business-to-business -business litigation. And the niche I've sort of fallen into is plaintiff's class action work, representing shareholders uh, when there are mergers or acquisitions and making sure they get paid uh, properly for their shares. Okay. Can you expand on that a little bit? What type of class action, other than, you know, the basic titles that you just gave, some of the cases that you may have handled? Sure. Yes. We've done, I actually helped try the case against uh, a mutual fund company uh, that had uh, a very precipitous drop in the value of a bond fund that a bunch of retired people were in. That was back in 2008. We tried it uh, in Milwaukee. It was the only civil trial of a class action to go that year. Um, I'm involved now in something a little different for me in the opioids class action oh. against the manufacturers and distributors. I have two of the counties in Wisconsin. I'm the local counsel for that. Um, I've also uh, represented retirees against various governmental entities when their benefits were cut. Uh, but most of the work I do is more the shareholder type work, either with the, in connection with uh, misrepresentations made in a public offering, uh, or if uh, a merger and acquisition is not compensating the shareholders adequately. And that's also an area I kind of fell into. Uh, there's, a, there's a really, really good firm out of San Diego, uh, which is one of the reasons my daughter is there. That was my connection. And uh, they started working with me, and so I do all their Wisconsin work as far as I know, and, and they're very excellent attorneys. I mean, some of the sharpest minds I know. And they become very, very good friends of mine. They're my daughter's adopted family out there, and, and that really is the reason she's there, uh, is how much I like San Diego. That's amazing. So do you get to go visit her very often? Because that would be an amazing trip to be able to take right now. Well, I, I was talking to her a couple of days ago, and she was complaining about the weather being 80, so I wasn't very sympathetic for her. But uh, I was fortunate uh, in May, we had a mediation out there in one of the cases that was, the mediation was in San Diego, so I slung out to uh, see her uh, and actually to bring her home, but I was able to make it a work trip. And uh, last year, my brother and I went out to see Jimmy Buffett with her, uh, which wasn't really a work trip, but, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a parrot head, as you know. I, that was my 54th <laughs> show. And uh, it was Sydney's fifth, so uh, that's pretty good for a 19-year-old. Nice. That is awesome. So awesome. Very, very nice. So in doing litigation and some of the work that you do, how did you end up deciding that's what you want to do? Well, that's got to go back to my brother, who, uh, as you can tell, is very, uh, is very dear to me. And very influential in your life, apparently. Well, uh, I, both my parents have passed away, but my father was a, a, a complicated man, let's say. And, and as someone once said, there are some people uh, who get very friendly when they drink, and my father was not one of those people. So my brother was always there for me, uh, and still is to this day. I would do anything for him, and I, I'm sure he would do anything for me. Mm -hmm. But he ended up sliding into uh, the father role considerably, and he said, look, uh, you've got to go, you, you want to litigate. You don't want to sit around in a room all day. You want to be in court. You are, you know, reasonably charming in small doses. Uh, you know, people <laughs> like you until they get to know you and you won't be in front of them that long. And you'd be bored otherwise. So he actually got me a job with one of the smartest guys I ever met in town who was a litigator. And like an idiot, I started working my first year of law school. Uh, and I was working 40 hours a week uh, while going to law school just because I liked it so much. That's very, very impressive. Well, I don't know if it's impressive or it just took me that long to get stuff done. Um, <laughs> but because it, it was different back then, because now you can go on any computer and you can research. But in, you know, I, I graduated in '89 because I'm old. Uh, but back then, you had like dedicated uh, research terminals. You couldn't just go on the internet and start doing legal research. And I remember I was two days at the firm, still in my first year of law school, and and one of the partners gave me this bankruptcy assignment. I knew nothing about bankruptcy law. I slept at the firm for two days just trying to put it together because I didn't want to go back and look like an idiot. Uh, as it was, I was just tired and an idiot because he had to sort of redirect me. But that was, uh, 
That was how it was back then. <laughs> and mind how things have changed, huh? Yes, I'm still tired, but I'm, I, I know a little bit more now. <laughs> Just a, a tad bit more right. now. Right. A tad bit more. So, okay, so the next question I would ask is, um, where do you practice law? I, uh, I just joined a firm called Mallory and Zimmerman in Milwaukee. Uh, nice. I had been, yeah, it's a, it's a great firm. I really like the guys. And um, it's, I had always been at purely litigation firms before and generally smaller. Uh, and usually I was the owner or <laughs> one of the owners. And uh, th there was a couple problems. One, I'm not a great administrator. Um, mm -hmm. So give, having somebody else handle that has been very good to me, good for me. And the other thing is this firm not only does litigation, we also do corporate and real estate work, and it's just a nice synergy that I can offer my clients services that I couldn't uh, at a purely litigation firm. And there are other litigators at this firm, but the other people can use me or the other resources as well. Nice. Very nice. So, and how long have you been practicing? I graduated in 1989, so we're coming up on 30 years in June. That's amazing. Well, again, it's lack of any other marketable skills. So <laughs> I don't believe that. It, it was too long. far. It was too far in at that point to, to figure I, out something else. I don't believe that not one bit. Mm, thank I you. really don't. Um, um, Let's talk a little bit about your awards, <laughs> awards that you have won. Well, there's a couple, there's a couple different recognition you can get. Uh, there's Super Lawyers, which is uh, from Wes, and I've been named in there since 2012. And there's uh, uh, Best Lawyers by US News, and I've been in there since 2012. But um, to be perfectly honest, the, 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 and, and uh, Martindale Hubble, too, is rate to A plus or ethical, but a lot of attorneys get that. But, the best rewards are when your opposing counsel sends you cases, uh, when they give you referrals in the future, or when your clients uh, refer cases back to you. And I've been very fortunate to have those relationships. Nice. Very nice. So, and if somebody would come in for a consultation, they want to talk to you, what can they expect during a consultation with you? Sure. Uh, the first meeting is always free because uh, I've got to figure out whether I can help you or not. And, and the, the hardest part of being a lawyer is sometimes just telling people that, one, they don't have a case, or two, you have a case, but it'll cost you so much to bring it and to succeed that it won't be worth your time. Um, so they can expect brutal honesty from me. Um, yeah, which is good. I think that people need that. I really do. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing because I, I had uh, one of the biggest cases I ever had was a very successful uh, defense of a software firm that they actually brought me out to Colorado to handle the case. And the only reason I got that case is because I had told the company uh, that they should not pursue uh, an action they had a couple months before. And he respected that. And even though he, another attorney had told him, you know, chase it, give me $10,000 down. Uh, and I just said, here's why you're going to spend more than you're ever going to get back. How much time are you going to spend on the litigation? That's going to be away from making money. And he respected that, so it paid off. Nice. And that's always the, the hard part of my job is to make people understand the flaws in their case at the outset. Because you would much rather have that discussion on day one than you would, you know, on day 600. And a lot of people come in and they say, look, I've been wronged, and I don't care what it costs, but I'm going to take these guys to court and we're going to make their lives miserable. And that lasts until bill number two because they've seen how much it costs. And then it's, you know, well, well what do you mean? How could it cost this much? So it's very important to have that conversation on day one and say, you know, this is, this is how it's going to go. And you can't always know how it's going to go because it's not like paving a road where you can have some idea of it'll cost me X to get from, you know, point A to point B. Because as somebody once told me, it's kind of like painting a room. You know, we try to paint the room, but then the other side comes in and puts graffiti all over it or paints it a different color, and then you've got to go back and, you know, paint it again. So it's hard to give an exact, you know, cost estimate or explain exactly how this is going to work. But after so many years, you have a pretty good idea of range of cost, and you just want to make sure that they sign on for that at the beginning and there are no surprises. Nice. Wonderful. Now, when someone comes to you, and typically, like you mentioned, you deal more with businesses than individuals, but if an individual were thinking, I need an attorney, what type of cases could a, 
an individual bring to you? The cases where I deal with individuals primarily are where they're owners of businesses. Um, because okay. you would be amazed how many people start businesses with friends, um, don't think about how it's going to end, uh, and then ultimately have some sort of falling out. And there's two reasons businesses have falling out. One, there's too much money, uh, and somebody gets jealous that you know Jane is taking too much and not earning enough, and then it becomes this issue of how do we separate the business and still you know let it run but get somebody bought out. And two is there's no money, <laughs> which is you know d depending on the situation just as bad or perhaps even worse. Um, but that's where I see a lot of individuals is you know hey I'm an investor in this deal. Um, my partner, we used to get along great, but now we don't. How can you help me out? Um, I also do things for, like, you know, if there's a contract that went bad, I mean, I, I would do that kind of thing. But that's most where I see individuals is when they're investors or if they'd invested with brokers who had treated them poorly um, or some kind of securities offering. Right. So that's, that's good for people to know, I think. I think that's really important for people to know. Second, you deal with a lot of bigger businesses. So if somebody has a business and they're looking, they have a problem with their business or they're looking for someone to represent them, what types of cases could they bring to you? Well, they could bring any kind of case, but where, where we can really provide value is litigation avoidance, which is how to keep you out of court. Because you know, once you're in court, the money is flowing, and as we said, um, you only have half control of what's going on at best because the other side's going to do what they're going to do. But we do things like you know, review the contracts of businesses to make sure that they're protected, to make sure that if a client doesn't pay, they can, we can collect our attorney's fees and we go after them, to make sure that uh, there's appropriate releases in there, to make sure that the individuals are protected behind the corporate form they've chosen. So there's all sorts of things we can do for businesses at any size uh, pre-litigation, and I prefer to do that. Um, to keep them out of litigation. Because it's amazing how many uh, very successful businesses started with no foresight at all in terms of what's going to happen when we grow. And you know what kind of protections are we going to need? How do we make sure we as individuals are not liable for things? And a business is just like a marriage, in, but, but people don't understand you should be thinking about how it's going to end because all the businesses do. Um, and that's what I do is business divorce. Oh. Nice. That's that's a really interesting way to put it. Well, it's not a very romantic sentiment, <laughs> no. but, but I mean, they're they're you know they're they're finite entities. Because, well, when people get into business, they think they 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 know. I think they know there's a possibility it could go this way, but they're so focused on it's going to go this way, it's going to look like that. They don't think about the dissolving of a business or the separating of a business and what that will look like. Right, Most people. You, you're focused on success. Is is how do we make right. this? How do we make this generate money? How do we get you know fat and happy, um, and and get the cash in? And mm -hmm. uh, right, but nobody ever thinks about the backside. Some people do, uh, yeah. until it's too late. And it's much easier to to work that out when everybody's getting along, right. <laughs> than it is once you're three quarters of the way through. And one of the things I know when people first go into business together, the little things on the contracts that they think, oh, this isn't a big deal, we're in this for the long haul, I'm not going to worry about this detail or that detail, those are the details that kind of bite you in the butt. Inevitably. Inevitably. Yes. But you think you can trust this person. Which is great, but that's why you can blame it on me. Exactly. You, you have it's somebody nice there to, to be the bad guy. guy. Right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. That's that's my role. <laughs> to be the fall guy. Right. Exactly. But that's really what we're doing more of, and I, I enjoy more than litigation because you can actually do something you know, productive and prevent litigation. Nice. That's a really nice role to be able to take on. When it works, it's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what was your first big case? And if you can't talk about all the details or names, that's okay, but... Well, it's ironically, and I think you know this, my first big case was actually in Sheboygan, where we're filming. Uh, when I was young and dumb, I, uh, <laughs> it was years ago, it was probably in the early 90s, uh, the two hospitals in Sheboygan that had been vicious competitors, I won't mention any names, they've both been sold a couple times, uh, got together to put together an ambulance service when the city of Sheboygan privatized its service. It, it used to be run by the police department. And at that time, the, the, the model was changing where if you outsourced everything and you know, didn't, it took everything off the payroll, the, you know, the private provider would do the benefits and everything else. 
So the two uh, competing hospitals merged into an ambulance service that they put up for bid with the city council and just assumed they would get the service. And I represented a Milwaukee provider who had been doing paramedic service all around the country and came in and blew them out of the water. And Sheboygan, uh, the city council chose my client instead of the homegrown one, which caused all sorts of, you know, consternation. And the two hospitals made life as difficult as they could possibly do. Uh, both hospitals wouldn't cooperate with my ambulance provider, and ultimately they were run out, and they came to me to represent them. And of course, it was me, three years out of law school, at a three-attorney firm against the two biggest firms in the state. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, as I say, it was young and dumb. And I, of course, I took it on a contingency basis, which I'm <laughs> probably too smart to do now. But it was fascinating. I, mean, I still remember we, we drove out, we filed suit in the Eastern District of Wisconsin. We drove out to get the Sheboygan Press. It was the first time my name was in, in a good way, in a newspaper. <laughs> It was a front page story out in Sheboygan. So, and in fact, I, I would take the same exit to get there. We used to go to city council meetings all the time, so it did bring back some memories on the way out here. It, it worked out just fine, but, uh, and, and that client has been a lifelong friend of mine uh, since then. Yeah, we did a lot of, had a lot, of, a lot of interesting cases together. That's very, very wonderful. So can you share with me a more intriguing case, perhaps? <laughs> well, I don't, know, I don't know how intriguing it could be. Uh, we, I, 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 we, we've represented a couple different uh, interesting uh, uh, businesses over the years. We, my, my partner had fallen into <laughs> representing an adult, uh, adult bookstore that had fire damage to it, and that resulted in some uh, interesting inventory sheets in terms of the various different products that had been uh, supposedly smoke damaged. We, we spent a lot of time laughing over that. I can only imagine. And we had an, an, another uh, adult entertainment center that had burned down. Those are only two adult entertainment cases, but they do stick out in my mind uh, over the years. Now, I can imagine, you mentioned earlier that right now you're involved with a class action suit that has to do with the opioid yes. epidemic. And that is such a sensitive and kind of a hot topic right now also. And there are, I think everyone at this point might know someone that in some way has been affected. It might not be your direct family, but it might be a friend's family or a neighbor's family sure. where they have somebody who has been directly affected by the, what they're calling the opioid epidemic. Sure. So in handling this case, I'm sure that there's a lot of passion for you in seeing, I don't know if justice or the right thing be done here. Well, it's actually one of the cases I'm most proud of because uh, yeah. usually what I do is moving, just moving money around and that's important and it's significant to people. But when you look at the opioid crisis, um, I mean, it's staggering. I had no idea until I started investigating. And I'm just a local counsel. There's national counsel that are handling these cases, which are all consolidated in Ohio in a multi-district litigation. But the, the impact that these painkillers, these late-stage life painkillers that I don't think were ever meant for you know, people of our age or younger, um, is devastating. And, and the addictive quality they have um, is frightening when you look at how people on, on relatively you know, quick turns become addicted to them. And as we were talking about the other day, in, in many situations, when they clamp down on the opioids, you see the heroin rate rise because it's such a gateway to heroin. It's the same feeling. And it, it's, it's such a, uh, the judge who's handling this in Ohio is a great judge. He, he's really trying to move these cases along and trying to get a settlement that will actually address this problem, which is more than just throwing money at something, but you know, it's a multifaceted problem. Is how do you educate people not to fall into that trap? How do you educate physicians who generally aren't trained on pain management in no. medical school? I mean, there's all sorts of things about law I wasn't trained as, um, and they learn about in many cases uh, pain management from the people selling them the drugs. So it's a it's a frightening situation. Uh, I think the statistics are for every ten people in the United States, man, woman, and child. There are seven opioid prescriptions written. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's frightening. It's, it's astounding, and I've heard some cases about the FDA and what they've passed that the doctors, as far as painkillers, the doctors have said, do not pass this. It's 
too addictive and the FDA has still passed it and passing so that five-year-olds can get oxy. What five-year-old needs oxy that's not in the hospital all the time? It just, it just, my mind can't even begin to process all of that. And it's, it really cannot. Some of the county people that are on the front lines that I work with, I mean, the dedication they have to really combating this problem, whether it be, you know, uh, kids who are in foster care because of the addiction of their of their parents and, yeah. and just the, I mean, the, the, the incarceration that's up so much, oh which gosh, again yeah. takes parents away from their, uh, from their kids. Um, and the deaths, I mean, the death rate has just skyrocketed for this, so, uh, for the opioid abuse. So I really admire some of the people at the county who are on the front lines and really spending time trying to make this work. And the difficulty in this case is going to be, how do we craft a solution uh, yeah. at the end of the day? I mean, with education and treatment and, uh, you know, and, and different areas need different solutions. So it's, it's, not, it's not the usual puzzle, which is how much money can I get for how many people? Uh, because money alone isn't going to solve this directly. Right, right. So, Scott, first and foremost, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. It's just so amazing to have you on and have you share your gifts with everyone. Please tell people how they can contact you. Sure. you can. Uh, uh, the easiest way to get me is I'm an attorney at Mallory & Zimmerman is my email. It's the, the quickest way. It's swagner, S-W-A-G-N-E-R, at mzmilw.com. Nice. Uh, and I will respond generally within 24 hours. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you again for being on the show. It's absolutely, positively such an honor, and I'm really grateful you were able to make the trip and sit here with me and discuss your journey and your path. So absolutely my pleasure, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And I want to thank you for joining us for this episode of Create a Life You Love. In the next episode... Jen and I will be making holiday spirits. What signature drink are you serving at your holiday meals? Find out on the next episode. Can I come back? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs>